there's a different equation at play when you're the business owner. It's not as simple as just showing up and getting paid. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Unix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running and managing an architectural practice that allows you to do your best work more often. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. The Big Red A is coming to San Francisco. If you're going to the AIA 23 conference, go stop by RCAT at booth 835. RCAT saves you time and money with over 10,500 manufacturer listings by alpha or CSI section, 7,000 free BIM models, 900 specs, and much more like Spec Wizard, the patented tool that allows you to configure and generate a full three-part specification in minutes. If you're a manufacturer of fine building products, also please stop by RCAT and see how they can get you in front of AEC professionals searching for the right solutions for their projects. Go ahead on over to the Big Red A at booth 835 at the AIA conference. I'll see you there. So today we're going to talk about how architects are used and abused, <laughs> some systemic problems in the architecture industry, and what you can do in the fight to support architects and architecture for the future and for the sake of our children and our societies. Hi, hey, Ryan. How are you doing today? I'm very good, hey, Nick. How are you? Great. So we're here to talk about an article prompts this conversation, but we're going to, th this is not uncommon with this article. Tell us, uh, the title here is Damn All Architects, The Rich Man's Folly. And the subtitle of this article is Your Projects, f Your Projects Four Months Late and 75 Grand Over Budget. And what did you expect when you hired a specky design wonk? And this was posted on November 26, 2022 on Saturday in the Times based over there in London. Yeah, so national newspaper, this this rather defamatory and am amusingly written but highly offensive article if you're an architect. Uh, Ryan, have you uh, noticed, Danny, what has been the response from the architectural community over there? What, have you seen anything on Twitter or architects responding to this article? And we'll, we'll read some of the lines out of here and kind of give you, our listeners, uh, an idea yes. of what the article says. But what, what have you heard in terms of responses? Yeah, I mean, on Twitter, there was uproar, if you like. I, I actually, I posted the article on Sunday evening. Actually, somebody, one of our ex-clients, past clients, um, sent me the article and then I posted it onto onto Twitter and then it was getting retweeted and shared around and I don't think people necessarily saw the funny side of it. Um, <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because people, people really reacted very strongly on Twitter and there was a lot of uproar and there was a lot of kind of, you know, Giles Corrin is an assiduous, disgusting weasel of a man. Who's and, the writer of the article? Yep. Yeah, a, a, like a, a, a scumbag who should be banned to the depths of hell and whatever. There was all sorts of like kind of attacks thrown his way. George Clark did retweet. Uh, he, he put it on his Instagram. So George Clark is a famous um, sort of architect TV presenter here and he was very upset um, at the article. And quite rightly, a lot of people were bringing to attention how poorly researched the article was um, and how there are a lot of kind of technical you know just errors and you know the story that he references for example when we were just looking at that about um, was it Simon Whitehead architects and who they're being sued by uh, their doctor clients for uh, allegedly um, spending their clients money on their own granny flat and I mean again I don't know all the details of something like that, but it, that already doesn't sound, I'm not entirely convinced that that's actually what has happened in that story. Sounds pretty fishy, sounds pretty fishy. It doesn't fishy. sound right, it, it doesn't sound, I mean, you know, what we were just looking at there, the fact that the architect, it doesn't sound, I mean, it's not usual for an architect to take money from the client and then give it to the contractor. The con Correct, the, yeah, the normally, architect. unless you're a desired build entity, uh, as a firm, you wouldn't you wouldn't be the pass through for money that goes to the builder. You'd, yeah. you'd separate. That'd be a separate contract, typically speaking. Exactly. So there's a couple there's, there's of details no... here that sound a little odd. Yeah, and so and this is this is all part and parcel of it. It all gets wishy washy and 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 messed up. And architects 
often end up becoming the one who are easiest to blame. And I think in general, we're an agreeable, polite, optimistic, um, altruistic group of, of people. And sometimes that we can we end up being a little bit vulnerable. And I think this article, I think if this article was written about any other profession, I would have found it amusing. And it is, and it is rather funny. So, I mean, we've we've shared it here at BOA with our with our clients, and we've read it out loud. And and in general, everyone found it quite amusing, but also upsetting at the same time. Because indeed, it's, it's and I mean, that sort of goes back to the idea that that even truth said in jest still hurts, right? So there's an element. There's some shards of 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 truth here, but not only truth, but also complaint the general that we find about architects. So I'm going to read here, just for those of you listening, uh, some of what this this pod, uh, this uh, this article says here. So I'll just read the, to contextualize what it talks about. The article starts out, a headline in the Times this week that ran, architect overcharged us to fund his new flat, struck me as a real dog bites man job. But I read on to see what villainy was afoot beyond the not exactly earth-shattering revelation that an architectural project had failed to come in on budget, and learnt that two doctors are suing their, their specky design wonk over claims he inflated the price of a $3.2 million domestic refurbishment to cover the cost of building a granny flat at his own home. So this is an opinion piece in response to this other article in the Times. Now he mm. continues, The fact is that this couple hired an architect, so what did they expect? So there's a bit of underhanded play against the architects as this is kind of debauchery, this kind of charlatan, charlatanism is, is natural in the industry. And he continues on quoting a fee and a time frame for a job and then spending twice as long on it and charging twice as much is what architects do. <laughs> I had to, had to laugh at that because I know that I've been, as an architect, I've been on the side of being the architectural practice who's trying to work within the budget constraints. But then we all know that you put it out to budget. It's more than you, you know, there's all these reasons the client has, their eyes are bigger than their wallet. They want to add in all this stuff that they see on HGTV that looks mm -hmm. so enticing. They have no idea how much it costs. And you say, you realize this is going to cause the budget to go up, but they say, no, 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 don't worry. We'll find the money. We'll find the money. We'll come up with it. And at the end of the day, when the price tag comes out being 4 million pounds, 4 million quid, as you all would say over there, uh, they scratch their head and they blame the architect as if it's that bloody architect's fault when the architect at the end of the day is probably not making much money on the job at all, just struggling to pay their mortgage and their rent. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so there's a, and there's a couple, there's a couple generalizations here in the article, uh, Ryan. One of the thing is that, that they said, um, so one has to assume uh, this article by Gils Corin kind of, Giles. In, in, got Giles, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it, um, it insinuates that they paid the architect a million pounds. Right now, if the if it's true that the money was going through the architecture firm to the builder, that could potentially be a possibility. However, we know that architects, when you're building costs, when your renovation's costing three million, four million pounds, that's not the architect's fee. That's yeah, simply so, what it costs to so, build the so, project. Yeah, so so they're saying a million pound in fee goes to the architect on a four million pound job. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like some architects charge that much, but I doubt that that was the case in this project. Yeah, I would doubt. I would doubt that very much, as well. Yeah. And it just it just sounds like there's you know a lot of kind of misinterpretations of the fact the architect is is here being blamed for all sorts of for all sorts of things. But this this conversation around, you know, the budget and the budget going over overboard and, you know, we hear this all the time. We hear it in big national projects. We hear it when there's uh, a museum that's being created. And often what's happening is the, you've got a legal and a finance team who are putting together some sort of brief. The problem as well here is that often these briefs are not put together with an architect at the table. Now that's something as an industry that we need to be addressing because that's a problem. And there's, I've got my thoughts and f feelings around why that why that is. But we've been kind of cut out of this process. What thoughts and feelings do you have about why that is, Ryan? Do tell. 
Um, well, I, I, in general, I feel that part of our education, one of the parts of our education that's missing is is financial literacy and financial competency and financial confidence and fluency. And when we talk about communicating value to our clients, often what ends up happening is we talk about the value that we perceive our services doing as architects. Okay, that's great. And sometimes our clients don't know that they didn't know these things. And sometimes they never know that they didn't know. And they don't realize what you saved them from. And then, you know, it goes, it kind of goes missed, right? But when we're talking about value, we want to be asking the question of, well, what's the value to the client? What's their perceived value? Okay. And that's a As different they question. It, yes. It's a, it's, a, it's a different question because we don't often know what is valuable to the client because we haven't asked. And sometimes we, we make assumptions. Out. Indeed. Right. And so this is why we have conversations about finding problems and uncovering emotional drivers for a project. And a lot of the problems or the value for a client is going to be some form of managing their finances and managing their money and understanding how their money is being is is going to be used and this is a conversation in architectural practice that's it's very wishy-washy it's very absolutely i don't know so let's let's there's there's two there's two kind of principles or subtle underlying conversations that i'm seeing here ryan the (laughs) first one is my my experience when I talk to friends of mine uh, who hire architects or clients who hire and work with architects. So for instance, I have a, a friend who does a lot of development work mm-hmm. and uh, works for a large development company. And they do a lot of work in New York City. They do a lot of work in Florida. And I mentioned that, you know, when they ask, well, Enoch, what do you do? Of course, I say, well, we help small architectural practices become better, succeed make money, have more freedom. And he kind of smiles and he says, wow, architects, really, how does that going? And I said, well, what's your experience with architects? And more often than not, actually not more often than not, every single time, right, every single time, they have complaints about architects saying, I can't get timely drawings out of them. The drawings are usually rubbish. They don't necessarily say that, but they say there's errors and there's mistakes in them. Um, And it's the same with, they're incredibly unorganized. Right? They tell us a deadline and they never meet it. They constantly push it back. Uh, we can't get a firm number out of them in terms of time it's going to take as well as what it's going to cost. Right, So these are the mm-hmm. complaints that I hear. I have another friend who was a senior senior project manager for a, one of the largest construction companies uh, in the Los Angeles area, and they were building this gigantic condominium tower by a highly, highly visible uh, Los Angeles architecture firm wins lots of awards, and he was just complaining about how the architects had drawn this light fixture underneath the balcony. The contractor wanted to swap it out because they saw a way to reduce a lot of costs just by using a different light fixture, but they, of course, they were going to do something that was on site. They were going from a a recessed fixture to a surface-mounted fixture. Now, as an architect, you know that that would be a ghastly change right depending on the design intent and how it looks if you have a if you quote if you designed it with recessed fixtures and it's on the underside of a balcony on your condo project i mean that could really make a big difference to sure it's going to save a few mo- a few dollars in bills here but the interesting part as i talked to him about it is as a contractor of course he didn't see he didn't see what all the hubbub was about as far as he was concerned the architects were just mm. these snooty artistic designers who wanted to have it their way when there was a practically a cheaper way to get it done, right? So there's this perception that I've seen both from contractors as well as developers that architects have their heads in the clouds, that they have no respect for budgets, that they're disorganized, that they can't get things done on time. And I see this also in a lot of our social media stuff that we put out here at Business of Architecture, it's interesting, we will get haters that hate on architects on comments on our content. Mm-hmm. So here's one, and I get I get a practice a comment like this every single week, but here's one that I just pulled out for the purposes of our, of our conversation today that kind of points at this kind of industry perception about architects. 
This is Christopher Evans, and interestingly enough, he has a cat as his uh, as his picture, <laughs> which goes he's to say something. Behind, he's hiding behind the kitty. He's hiding behind the kitty. We know what we know what we call those sorts of people. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> So here's what he says. He says, um, just uh, architects, just put together crap, conflicting information like the rest of them and just put the onus on the builders to sort it out so that the poor bastards like me have to spend countless hours making sense of a dog's dinner, right? So obviously a frustrated, frustrated contractor or tradesperson here, right? So there's this conversation of this. And then as architects, we just tend to get defensive. Oh, they don't understand. They don't know what it's like. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't appreciate. They don't see the value of what we're doing, right? Uh, what's, let's focus on, is there truth, Ryan? What do you think, right? We're both trained as architects. We both run architectural practices. We've worked in architectural practices. Now we consult with hundreds of firms, small, small practices from around the world. Is there any truth to the sub substantiation? What do you think? Uh, unfortunately, there is. Oh, Unfortunately, there is. Indeed. Yeah. Unfortunately, there is. There is truth to this, and and you know this is. I think. I, th I, I What I would say is that there are some architects, and there are a lot of architects who are fucking brilliant, yeah. and they are great communicators, and they do kick ass, and they do get their drawings out, and they do understand their clients. Um, you know, we've seen that work. We we've, we've worked with some of them, um, but there is there is a lot of a lot of misunderstanding and I mean again I, I put it down to this idea of not understanding what the perceived value is for the client what's the Indeed. client's understanding of value what's valuable Indeed. for them and so not being able to um, understand a financial agenda of the client and being able it, it's not good enough in a bit in business to to say to the client well we don't know how much it's going to cost okay and okay I understand that there's this kind of this kind of haze around procurement and how much things are going to 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 how much they're going to come out at and the contractor is deciding at but there's got to be we've got to that's a very sensitive conversation if there's this many unknowns that we need to be leading somebody through very carefully and making sure they understand where all these unknowns are actually occurring and the risks that are happening now from a from a um, developer's perspective, it was interesting. I was interviewing um, an architect this morning who was very kind of business astute and, and was very interested in the world of developers and didn't see all developers as, um, you know, kind of profit greedy maniacs, um, but actually had a very um, broad perspective on what developers were doing and understood the struggles that developers often have during financing and the pressures that they get put under from institutional finances or from their investors and how the investors in there and um, people are scrutinizing all of their numbers to make sure that it's going to come back and it's going to give the delivered and the promised return on investment. So the investors are being squeezed at the top. Well, they're, they're, they're in a situation where they're being made to promise something. So they make promises and then it gets squeezed all the way down. And so then what we have is we've got a hole that the architecture services need to need to fit in into. And at that point, that's when the architect tries and squeezes their services into this little hole and it's not going to work. And then this is where you get drawings that are turned up late and, you know, it all starts to kind of fall apart because we're trying to squeeze into this hole. But what, you know, an enlightened kind of conversation, it would be to start talking about an understanding or at the very least meeting the developer client where they're at and kind of understanding the financial pressures that they're under and the scrutiny that they're under and perhaps start to talk about different um, structures for, for fees or for finance or, you know, the architect I was talking to this mm -hmm. morning was was actually innovating in terms of a whole procurement method and was innovating with digital manufacturing and basically doing away with the whole tender process altogether and being able to produce a set of you know digital information that could be then given to manufacturers and not get an estimate but actually get a quote for the work because these, these are the people that were actually going to fabricate it and it was going to be assembled so we are starting to see big shifts in with disruptive technology that's going to be able to, for those who are business savvy, 
and you know want to speak the language of 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 the developer and understand where the value is are going to be able to innovate and use technology to kind of help solve these sorts of problems and thus create more value so ryan talking about that you said it so well. So the, to this, I, this, this small hole into which clients try to fit architectural fees. So in other words, from the start of a project, they're working the accountants and the finance and legal team. They're working the pro forma. They're figuring out how, what's the budget for the project? Where's the financing going to go? And then a lot of times they will just, like you said, they'll set, well, this is how much we think in the past we've paid for architectural fees. It's probably going to cost about this much. There's a story that I found to be very, very persuasive in the architecture industry. And I know because because I used to believe it myself, and the story is this, that we're limited on what we can charge for our services by what our clients are willing to pay us. Mm -hmm. So the story is that I'm limited about what I'm able to charge by what our clients are willing to pay us. And so a lot of times what we see is we see architects coming to us and they're telling us about their business problems that are the challenges of running a small architectural practice, not having enough time to do all the many things that need to be done, having difficulty hiring qualified team members. As a result, that then causes another treadmill of the owner having to wear so many hats because they're trying to make up the slack for what people may not know or get wrong or trying to train up junior team members, which doesn't give them time to focus on parts of the business that need to be focused on, so they leave them undone, perhaps procrastinating invoices, perhaps neglecting marketing or business development, and then just puts the practice very vulnerable to the cycles we see about recessions and a staff member leaves and suddenly it's the end of the world, right? But yeah. Let's go back. But at the at the very root cause of this, what we if we drill down, what we'll usually find is we'll find that it comes back to scarcity of money. Mm -hmm. Like really scarcity of money of what comes is is the pro is like one of the root causes of all of this. So as architects, as we accept projects where we say this is what I'm not going to charge more because I think this is what my clients are willing to pay, we're not actually working backwards from like this is actually how much I need to run the business. This is how much I need to pay my staff. This is how much I need to pay myself, not just a, a good, but a fantastic salary. This is the amount of money we want to have for profit. This is the amount of money we want to invest in business development and marketing. This is the amount of money we want to set aside for improvements in our technology. This is the amount of money we want to set aside to be able to give ourselves space and time to buy back our time so we can focus on innovating and focus on more creative pursuits about how we're gonna respond and provide greater value to the marketplace. Like none of this happens, and so what ends up happening is we see architectural fees, especially for smaller practices, are are, are set up at, at sort of the architect is like, this is the bare minimum that I can do this for, and that's kind of like, that's where they set the fee at. As opposed to saying, no, I wanna run a practice where I can invest in innovation, where I can hire the best team members, where I have money literally coming out of the coffers. And then the reason they give for not having that is, well, my clients just won't pay it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see that. We see that unfortunately too too often. That this that this the a lack of um, financial. I I'd even say sometimes it's a lack of financial interest. And absolutely, we know that absolutely. Yeah, and and there, and there's there's a there's a pain and there's a suffering that comes with it and I think there are many businesses and architecture owners now who you know they they really relish in the business side of it and they get interested in okay I, I do want these things I want to be making thirty percent profit on on my projects and I want to be paying people a, a decent amount of money and okay here's what we've been charging how how are we going to raise our fees because that's the, that's a good question how yeah. are we going to raise our fees. Yeah. Rather than I can't, it's not possible. It's like how, and and then going out and finding examples of, oh right, there are these practices that are charging, they're make they're charging eighteen percent on these residential projects. On, I love that. You know, one of my mentors said, "Ask a better question, get a better answer." So the beauty of asking a question like that is it allows the mind to come up with the solution. But when mm -hmm. we put ourselves in the victim state, when we say, you know what, this is just what my clients are willing to pay, or this is just what clients expect to pay for our services, we're complete victims. We have no power in the matter. Mm -hmm. We have no Absolutely. say. We have Absolutely. no say. 
And so no, at a very core, it starts with how we frame the question in our own minds. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting, you know, that there's when that that kind of illustration I described of of clients putting the architect number one as kind of a commodity and squeezing them into a into a fee hole if you like mm-hmm. here you've got to do the work here this is i've got to say this is this is on in part in large part this is on us well it has to be this is on i us. mean this we're, is we're the architects right no one no one else is we, saying architects you must do this yeah we've we've number one we've kind of accepted it but number two we have been in reactive mode and have not been in proactive mode in terms of prospecting, in finding work, in educating ourselves better, becoming financially literate, understanding what the financial agendas are of our clients. And kind why do you of think that is, them. Ryan? I, th- I, th- I think there's a general lack of interest in it. I don't think it's a sexy thing I th- to I do. I think it's, it's not deeper than that. Design. I think I would suggest that there's a fear around it. Do tell. Okay. So what I've noticed in my own life is that I default to the areas in which I'm most comfortable. So let me give you a quick example. Mm. So with my kids, we just started doing jujitsu. I thought it'd be a great way for me to spend time with my kids. They're getting older. They're teenagers now. I thought, what a great opportunity for me to head out in the evenings, do something physical with them. We can exercise. We're doing something together. We can wrestle. Sounds like great fun. Now, when I stepped into the jujitsu, I don't know, the, the studio, I guess they call it, and I see everyone out there with their geese on and they're wrestling, and they're doing all these moves. I mean, first of all, instantly I'm intimidated. It's just natural feeling inside of me to think like, wow, this is a little intimidating. I have no idea. I feel like a fish out of water. I'm scared. So what comes up inside of me is this feeling of fear, of, of insecurity, however small, right? And... Couple that with my my experience of in this, you know, the first couple of weeks, there was definitely the high of something new. So that kind of made the fear recede in the background because I'm like, oh, this is new and exciting. But what started to happen as I started to practice and I started to do this and I started to realize how bad I sucked at it, like how mm-hmm. terrible I was. <laughs> I mean, I remember the very first day that we were there, the evening, the instructor's guy named Tom Knox. He's like a three-time world champion jiu-jitsu martial artist he's won the world championship like this dude is like a complete stud right and and so <laughs> it's like it's about about 45 minutes in they've shown us some introductory moves and says okay here Enoch, it come over here and you're gonna wrestle with me and so he i was you know he put we we got in a position where we're competing against each other and uh and he just kind of sat there and lazily did some moves on me while I am huffing and puffing and I'm sweat is dripping down me and I just know I look like a fool and I am being worked over and it's like it's bringing up all my insecurities about being <laughs> about being weak about being not enough about I don't know what I'm doing and this sucks and what are people thinking when they're watching Enoch is a weakling you know and so I'm dealing with all this mind chatter that's highly uncomfortable it's psychologically uncomfortable it doesn't make me feel good, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, I've realized that, well, he's just showing me who the king of the studio is. He's just making sure I know who, <laughs> just in case I get cocky, right? But there's this element, there was this point a couple of weeks in where I thought, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if I can do it. Seth Godin refers to this as the dip. He says, when we start out something new, we start out with a bit of enthusiasm about it, but when reality sets in, we realize that it's going to take a lot of work to master this skill, then it becomes discouraging. Then we want to quit. We don't want to do it. So what I find is that as architects, there's these four stages we talk about. There's the asleep stage, there's the aware stage, there's the activated stage, and then there's the awake stage. Now, when we look at any area or problem that we're suffering in our practice, first of all, we're going to have to find out where do we sit on this continuum. And what I know is when I, back in 2009, when I was starting my practice, my first practice, actually my second practice, I was asleep to the skills that I needed. I knew I was experiencing these symptoms, but I was asleep. I didn't even realize or recognize why I was experiencing those symptoms. Okay, so when we look at architects, going back to why I, I'm going to submit that there's fear involved here, 
is because at the end of the day, we're talking about skills of communication, skills of persuasion, skills of selling value, skills of business development. These are things that, first of all, as architects, we're not naturally gifted at because we're more introverted. We're not the backslappers. We may not be the best verbal communicators. I know for myself, I'm more of an introvert. I would rather sit there and listen right? So these skills of being able to present our fee, of being able to persuade a committee why we should charge three times as much as our competitor, these things put us outside of our comfort zone. They throw us into fear. It's scary, scary to try to put ourselves in those situations and try to develop those skills. So there's a couple of problems here. First problem is we don't even recognize the skills that we're lacking. We just think that it's the industry and I'm in, I'm complete victim of circumstance here and the industry's jacked and why can't they just let me do architecture? When in reality, I've invested very little time in learning how to sell. I've invested very little time learning how to market, very little time learning how to present my services, very little time learning how to develop business. I mean, how many architects have actually taken a a course or a seminar on business development, on simply how to network, how to build relationships that turn into work? I mean, very few. Mm -hmm. And yet these are the skills that are essential to solve the problem of not having high fees. It's it's very, yeah, bang on what you're what you're saying um i remember when i was talking to my this you know many years ago and i was talking to uh my business mentor and was complaining to him about how difficult it was and being able to raise fees and was you know it's it's so hard it's so difficult and he just went boo hoo hoo and then <laughs> Who? Here's this, and he's, and I was like, "What's that?" And he's like, "That's a tiny violin." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's like me going to the jujitsu studio and saying it's so hard to win a jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, and and he, and he and he said to me, he said, he said, "Well, what did you expect was going to happen?" He was like, "How much how much sales training have you done in the past? How much marketing have you understood? How much business development have you have you learned? How many businesses have you run?" Yeah. How do you measure profitability? What are your financial skills? Do you understand this? Do you understand that? And I was like, no. Right. So you've gone and you've you've trained for seven years as an architect. You set up your own business in architecture, in architect practice, in a massively competitive field that's been with well-established players who have got 30 years experience and you're finding it difficult. What did you expect was going to happen? Oh, what did you expect on. was going to happen? And I was like, kind of, you know, tail between my legs. And, but it was funny. You know, it was done in a loving, loving and humorous way. Yes. And it was yes. like, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no shame in not knowing any of this stuff. It's, it, but, it's, but there is this kind of wake up of, well, what do you expect? Like, we know that this stuff isn't covered in architecture school. We know that the education doesn't, doesn't have it. Okay, so we we need to be open to recognizing and learning these new skills. And yeah, these skills, some of these skills, particularly sales, negotiation, it involves another human being. It involves speaking to somebody. It involves putting something at risk. It, oh. put, it, invo- it involves putting yourself out at risk because someone might say no to you and they might reject you. Indeed. And you've put loads of effort into it. You know, like as an employee in a business, you rock up to work every every day, and if you go and sit down and do your 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 nine to five hours or nine to six or half six if you're an architect hour, hours a day, you get paid every month. Okay, generally you get paid. Your salary comes out. Okay, you you show up, you do the right things, and someone pays you. Even if you do a pretty shit job, you'll still get your monthly salary for a, for a, for a period of time until they kind of get rid of you. Right, but as a business owner, you can show up every day to work. You can get up at seven a.m. and be in the office and work till ten o'clock, and you can work your absolute guts out and put everything you you can possibly think of into it, and then you don't get paid, and Absolutely. then you're fighting to get to, to get to to for the client to pay the to pay the invoice, or you know you've got bills or you're st- you're getting now all their responsibilities on you okay so it, there's a different equation at play when you're the business owner it's not 
as simple as just showing up and getting paid. Okay, there's 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 all these and other it's just those clients we... taking advantage of us, Ryan. It's all those <laughs> slimy clients. <laughs> well, you mentioned so you mentioned negotiation. Here's one example, right? You just mentioned negotiation in your so uh, when clients apply to work with us, the business of architecture team, they have to speak with someone on our team. Usually, it's me. And I interview them to see if they'd be a good fit for what we do. And uh, I remember early on, I was having a conversation with one of these architects, and they they were describing the challenges of running a small practice. And I asked them, "So, what what training and negotiation have you have you taken? Right? Have you done any negotiation training?" And they said, "Oh, well, we don't negotiate. We don't negotiate." And I didn't realize it at the time, but what I realized right after that conversation was that this was a blind spot that the architect had. Mm -hmm. So it was a blind spot because they didn't even recognize the need or even see that there was any negotiation happening. Because in their mind, negotiation was, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to offer you 20,000 pounds to do this project or 120,000 pounds to do this project. They come back and say 80. No, I say 100. They say 90. Okay, let's meet in the middle at 95,000. Okay, deal done. Shake hands. Let's go to work. That's typically what what people think of when they think of negotiation. But what, what they don't realize is that negotiation is so much more than that. When you write out a proposal and you send that to a client, that's negotiation. Now, it's a very rudimentary, very amateurish, and very unsophisticated way of negotiating. It's basically a way of kind of, for lack of better words, bending over and saying, okay, have at me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But that's what it is. Every time you get to that fee conversation with the client and you present your fee and they accept your fee, that is a negotiation. No matter how you slice or dice it. Right. And so the fact that this architect told me and, and I'm sure I could ask 80 percent of architects, like if they if they negotiate or what their skills are in negotiation, they probably say, well, it's not relevant or we don't negotiate or yeah, no, we haven't done any negotiation training because they don't see it as relevant, mm-hmm. which is a blind spot. Yeah. Right. Misunderstanding that everything is a negotiation. You better believe when you're talking with a client, whether they're institutional, whether they're private residents whether they are a small commercial project or a large hotel or hospital, the entire proposal process is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really, this is where we actually see, we, we start to see a lot of the success with some of our clients when they really take on the enjoyment that comes from negotiating. And getting creative with how their fees might get structured. I'll, get, I'll give an example. One of our clients that we're working with at the moment, they have started working with, they've been working with developers, and rather than just getting a straight fee, they've started to negotiate a base rate fee. Here's what we'll do for the for the for the work, and for every unit that we get on the site and get approvals for we'll have an uplift we'll have a bonus we'll have a kickback we'll have some sort of little uptick and they know their stuff they're pretty confident they're going to be able to get how many sites how many units they 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 want to get onto the site and if this project comes through they're looking and they get all of the the units on site they're looking at more than two times their usual fee for the project beautiful that's a negotiation boom and they've created it there you go and they and they, they just they, they just doubled or almost tripled their fee just based upon having a different value proposition and just clearly yeah. identifying the value for the client yeah and and again this this is this is where you know we kind of come back to this idea of where the value is and the perceived value to the client and the more mm-hmm. that we 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 understand then you know then we can start getting creative and you're quite right the thing that holds us back is fear and then fear masquerades itself often as much more straight how do i describe this 
Fear often masquerades itself as reasonableness. Abs, oh, that's well said. Well said. A good example. <laughs> well, just like just like raising the fee, that would be a great example. Uh, the reason why we don't want to charge a higher fee is at the end of the day is because we're scared. That's that's all there is to it. But the reasons that we tell ourselves mentally may be like, well, I don't want to overcharge the client, or we can get it done for this, or all these stories and narratives that we place around why we set our fee where we set it. Mm-hmm. It's interesting when you get interested in sales and negotiation and sometimes you'll watch how people interact. And, you know, I think a lot of a lot of architecture clients, a lot of architects, their clients, particularly the very wealthy ones, the ultra high net worth individuals or the high net worth individuals, they're often working with some of the best negotiators on the planet. And there's a lot yeah. to learn from these guys. You know, you're often working with titans of industries like you know, and, and we you know we've again we've had clients who have sat down and asked their clients, "How do you do that? How do you negotiate? What do you do with your clients?" That becomes an in, again another interesting conversation, particularly if you're dealing with people who are, you know, successful in that kind of domain. Absolutely. Well, just just imagine this. Let's just zoom out a second here. What we're talking about is architects. We're trained as designers, and you're pitting us against. And I guess pitting sounds a bit confrontational, but that's what happens in a negotiation. Let's go. We're using all the the, the fight analogies today, for sure, right? That you're pitting, you're you're going up against. A lot of times, you're going up against people who negotiate for a living. Mm -hmm. It's like you're you're an untrained fighter. You're going into the ring with a seasoned fighter, and you're wondering why you come out bloody all the time. And then you just keep on doing it again and again and again, and just thinking, "Damn, it's just." It's just this fighting thing. I got to stop doing it because it doesn't work. No, it's because you need to go get trained on how to fight better. <laughs> and then perhaps the author of this article, Giles, how did you say it? Giles? Giles? We don't, we don't Giles. name people that in the United States of America. Giles? What is it? G Les. Let's call him G Les. G Les. <laughs> so here, here's, here's another art. Here's what he says. This is funny. Th this actually made me chuckle. <laughs> he said that, um, uh, he said, now look, I know I am being pretty tough on architects here, and my wife has warned me that there will be a backlash. <laughs> but he says, but I'm not afraid of architects. It's not like writing a thousand words about how much I hate cage fighters or Islamic Jihad. <laughs> what are you going to do? Draw me to death with your little rotating pencil with your initials on it? <laughs> oh, that's some good humor. I had to laugh at that. Yeah. I mean, he really, he really tears apart. He he tears rips apart architects here, but but we know there's an element of truth to it because we know a lot of clients and people who work with architects can identify with this, right? So the question is, where's the best practices? Where are where are the companies and the architectural practices who are investing in project management, who are investing in proper resourcing, who are investing in negotiation skills, who are investigate in, investing in sales training? who are investing in how to communicate powerfully with clients and set expectations. Because a lot of the challenges that happen during the project delivery process are simply lack of expectations, right? I mean, I, I'm yeah. just guilty of the rest. I remember, I don't know, Ryan, if you ever did this, now I'm sure none of our listeners have ever done this, but I remember when a project started to go sideways or take longer, I would actually kind of want to hide and like not respond to the email and maybe hope that if I just tried to hurry up and finish the drawings in a couple of days, I could send them without having any sort of conflict. <laughs> and from what we hear about clients, this is, it seems like this is a pretty common, common uh, approach to project management. Yeah, the head, the ostrich method. Yeah, the ostrich methods. I think I did learn that at a pro at a project management seminar once. Um, it was number five of ways to successfully manage a project: just hide your head in the sand and hope the client doesn't notice that it's taking twice as long. Just, just, just bamboozle them with the design. They'll be happy in the end. They'll be happy in the end. They won't mind. They'll forget all about it. Yeah. So, where do we go with this, Ryan? So, what you know. We can't accept responsibility as architects for all the misconceptions about about architecture and what we do. But at the same time, articles don't come out like this, and I don't get Facebook comments like this out of thin air, mm -hmm. right? So what responsibility do we have as architects to be able to help our profession endure 
and not only endure but thrive i you know i think that this the skills that you've been we've been discussing here are what we should be investing in these Absolutely. are but ryan i can invest in those because i'm not making enough money i don't have enough money to invest in those things here we go is the reasonableness <laughs> I don't have enough money to take time away to go invest in a sales training seminar. Besides, all the sales trainers, they're selling widgets, and those things don't apply to architecture. That's going to be a, 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 that's going to be a long life. Yeah. Well, if only there were a company like Business of Architecture that actually trained and taught architects how to do these things in ways that are specifically trained for architects. Ugh. I know. Someone should come up with that. I know. Someone should. If anyone comes up with something like that, please <laughs> let us know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Get, get in. Get in touch. I mean, this is this is what we've been doing for the last few years, and we've had hundreds and hundreds of clients. Well, here's come an example. Let me, let me just mention this to give our give our uh, our listeners some some perspective here. Maybe architects, like. There are systemic problems from not charging enough. It goes back to money, right? So, for instance, mm -hmm. this year I invested. I we invest a lot in business of architecture in our team members. So we we spend a lot of money training our team members. Um, you know, we spent almost the salary of one of our team members putting one of our team members through a training program. So imagine that. Let's say that your employees bringing you know earning eighty thousand dollars or eighty thousand pounds. We invested that same amount simply in professional development for that employee. Eighty thousand pounds, eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? And yeah, I often talk to architectural practice owners of smaller practices, and I say, well, you know what? Why don't you invest in this program that Business of Architecture offers? It costs five grand or it costs twenty grand, and their jaw hits. I mean, their draw, jaw just hits the ground. Well, we can't afford that. That's way too much. I'm like, okay, this is this is a quarter of what you pay an employee and you're not willing to invest or you don't have the ability to invest that kind of money in your employee. So the question you should be asking yourself is why not? Why can't you take the time off to invest in these yeah. experiences? Why can't you t afford to invest in the skills I'm, to improve I'm, yourself in this manner? And, and the, other, the other part of the inquiry here is what is it going to cost you to not do this? Ooh, what is it going to That's the unseen cost? costs. Yeah, what what is it what is it going to cost? What is it costing you right now? And what is it going what is it costing you over the period of a 5-year span or 10-year well, span? Well, that's and that's the part we never look at. And this is when it starts right? to become That's like I'm not going to get a gym membership or I'm not going to go exercise because I don't want to pay the gym fee. I'd rather pay the hospital Hundred fifty thousand dollars for a double bypass surgery. <laughs> yeah. All the all the all the missed opportunities and the kind of the the poor quality of experience and the unrealized potential. Absolutely. So there's hidden costs. There's opportunity costs. Yeah, that's the part that we don't see. So, see now, now we're starting to have a conversation like a, a like a business person would have. So, a proper business person, when they look, these are business questions. When we look at investment, when we look at investing in things like our clients, our skills, and our training, we're not just looking at what it costs. We're looking at it as an investment. What am I going to get for this investment? It changes the equation. Yeah. Yeah, and having and starting to have the ability of, of. All, you know, in business, there's there's risk and reward, and we have different tolerances for risk. And good business people protect the downside, but they're looking for intelligent risks for them to jump on with. Yeah, right. Yeah. Good good entrepreneurs are looking understand the nature of risk and what's involved in putting something forward in a business. Great entrepreneurs see risk and regardless of outcome, know that the risk is an investment. So again, one of my business mentors once said to me um, that the failures are only failures if you don't turn them into an asset. Absolutely. And that actually some Absolutely. of the mistakes that you make and the things that go wrong, if you don't debrief them, if you don't 
take the energy and the effort to turn them into an asset, then they are going to cost you a lot. However, Absolutely. you might make a mistake. You might make a, you might blow a few grand over here in something, you know, you've, you've paid for some sort of advert and it didn't work. Okay. But if you don't debrief from that, then that will just be a loss. Whereas if you take away the, if you, if you turn the lessons from it and you're kind of, you, you take the business lesson from it, then it can become an asset. We see this a lot in negotiations and sales, right? Where you've, you were, we were with, you were with a particular prospect, you said something, it didn't work. And then you feel that you lost the, you lost the client. And sometimes we'll see people turn around and like, oh, it's just stupid. It's the clients. It's the marketplace. It's this sales system. I'm not doing this anymore. Blah 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 blah. Rubbish. Not going to do it anymore. Okay. And that's just that's a failure because then it stops, and it's an unwise approach. Whereas the taking complete responsibility for everything and looking at the situation and being like, okay, what was missing? What worked? What didn't work? What was the context? Let's have a look at the conversation. Let me think of 200 different ways of how I could have handled that conversation and evaluate which, which ones would have been much more effective. And let me practice them. Right. It okay. goes back to the analogy like the little toddler try learning how to walk, right? Oh, the baby mm-hmm. fell down. Well, let's, let's not ever try that again. <laughs> <laughs> that was an unsuccessful attempt to walk. I better just crawl the rest of my life. Babies say that? No. Mm-hmm. I, I take my car out for the first time. I'm learning how to drive. And in the old days, I was using a stick shift. I I stalled the car in an intersection. Oh, these cars are rubbish. I'm going to go back to walking. Like we don't do this in any other areas of life. And yet when it comes to our business, when it comes to our practice, it's like we fall into these these patterns of saying, oh, it didn't work. Instead of looking at the win, where's the win? Where's the win? Where's the lesson? Yeah. It's a powerful mindset. It's a growth mindset, right? Um, Is it Angela Duckworth? Is she the one that talks, it has wrote that book about, um, what was that? Growth mindset. If our, our, if you haven't read or listened to that book, we highly, highly recommend it. Um, She talks about, let's see, let me look this up here, Ryan. Yeah, let's have a look. What's the name of that book? Uh, do you remember off the top of your head, Ryan? Have you read that book? No, I don't know it. Let me see if I can look it up here. Let's see, what is it? Growth mindset. She talks a lot about growth mindset. Grit. Is that the is that the let's see, let's see the book. Grit, the power and passion of perseverance. Yeah, it's a great book, great book. In the book, you know what? And actually the one I was thinking about actually was, I think it was by Carol Dweck. Right. Mindset, Carol Dweck. But it made this really interesting point. It's called, okay, so there's another book here. Carol Dweck, it's called, uh, let's see, mindset the psych, the new psychology of success. But here's here's what we've dis- I've discovered over the past decade plus about running businesses and being in businesses that just because we run an architectural practice, that doesn't mean that we're really a business person. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying there, Ryan? So a lot of times I know, I think that, you know, and I thought in the past, like, oh, if I run an architectural practice and I own a business, I'm a business person. Right, that's like saying like, well, I went into the jujitsu studio and therefore I'm a world-class jujitsu master. Not necessarily. Right, and so what, what Carol Dweck says in her book about mindset is she says that there's these key differentiators, people that, that succeed are people, and they've actually measured this, people who succeed in life, they have what's called the growth mindset. And 
along with growth mindset comes the idea that when I fail, when something doesn't work out for me, I'm always looking to adjust and figure out why did that thing not 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 succeed? How can I adjust? How can I change what I'm doing to find another path to get to the end goal and do something that actually works? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's this relationship with failure as being a function of performance, of high performance. Yeah, I mean, you know, it goes back to the old Michael Jordan commercial, right? You know, what is that? Was it was it a Nike commercial? You know, he t- talks about how he... Oh, the one he, I've missed... Two, I've missed 2,000 yeah, free throws. Yeah, I've missed. Yeah. All the free throws he's missed, all the layups he's missed. I mean, in baseball, if you bat 300, basically meaning you strike out 70% of the time, you're you're like a major league baseball player. <laughs> but it's difficult. It's difficult to fail, and it sucks to do things that don't work. And it is, you know, being in the business world and going – Toe to toe with people who are more are more experienced in business, or have been trained in negotiating, or have been trained in selling, or have been trained in, in project management, it's difficult. It's difficult, which is one of the reasons why it's it's no cakewalk to run an architectural practice, mm-hmm. right? But it can be. It can be, if you invest in the training and skills that allow you to have a practice that has what we call the three F's: freedom, fulfillment, and exceptional financial reward. So only when we as architects, what we believe here, Ryan, right, is that as architects, we can change the narrative, but it's going to come down to us. It's not going to happen overnight, but we can change the narrative about things like this article by being able to start to have better business practices, being able to keep better, uh, you know, better communication with our clients. So scope creep doesn't happen, or when it does happen, the clients take responsibility for it instead of blaming us for it. Because what happens often, more often than not is we as architects accept a fee for the project that now we're scrambling to get the project done, we're cutting corners. We all know what it's like when we're we're worried about the fee. When the fee has run out, we're, we're already not wanting to spend as much time. Design quality suffers, and the entire industry gets a bad rap. So, Ryan, where can people go to find this article? It was pretty entertaining if they want to look it up. We can post it in the show notes, a link to it. We'll post it in the show notes. I think if you just Google, um, if you if you Google the headline. Yeah, which was uh, Damn All Architects, The Rich Man's Folly. If or yeah, if you just or if you just type in um, Jailez Coren. (laughs) Jailez Coren. (laughs) Jailez Coren. Architect, I'm sure it will just pop up into Google, but we'll put it into the sh- into the show notes. All right, great stuff. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing: if you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. The Big Red A is coming to San Francisco. If you're going to the AIA 23 conference, go stop by RCAT at booth 835. RCAT saves you time and money with over 10,500 manufacturer listings by Alpha or CSI section, 7,000 free BIM models, 900 specs, and much more like Spec Wizard, the patented tool that allows you to configure and generate a full three-part specification in minutes. If you're a manufacturer of fine building products, also please stop by RCAT and see how they can get you in front of AEC professionals searching for the right solutions for their projects. Go ahead on over to the Big Red A at booth 835 at the AIA conference. I'll see you there. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.